important, first of all, to say you're all very welcome. I'm Mark Varian. I'm chair of the Energy and Environment Group in the British Irish Chamber of Commerce. And this is the second of three in a series that we're running uh, before the COP26 um, event. And we're just highlighting areas of the, decar the, the path to decarbonisation that, to be honest, are, are tricky. And transport is one of those. In two weeks' time, we have another um, seminar on uh, the agricultural sector. And we really what we're trying to develop is a discourse and debate around these tricky sectors uh, to stimulate uh, those involved and try and find solutions, which some are, some are short term, but some are, will take longer. We'll hear uh, Dr. Bob Moran um, from the um, Department of Transport in the UK, followed by Quivine O'Kiron, I hope I've pronounced your name right, Quivine, my apologies if I haven't, uh, who's in the Department of Transport's Climate Action Division in Ireland. And then we'll have a panel discussion. Um, we've got a diverse range of people on that panel. There's people who are involved in manufacturing technology in the transport sector, using technology, and also people trying to find ways that we can minimise the use of, uh, you know, the, the need for transport, transport. So it's going to be an interesting debate. Um, as I said, we, we really think it's important to start off with the infrastructure uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, now, in terms of dates, for the largest trucks, 44 tonne trucks, we think that 2040 is probably the right time to be suggesting now that we're going to end the sale of new diesel uh, trucks in the UK. Um, but zero emission technology, as we all know, is that it moves so fast, it is moving so fast. So if you look down the lower weight categories, commercial vehicles, so three and a half tons all the way up to 44 tons of then we don't think you need to wait that long until 2040 for some of the smaller vehicles. So we're actually proposing that we split commercial vehicles and have a different phase out there of 2035 for those vehicles that are 26 tons. Um, so we've consulted on that recently in the UK and you may or may not expect to hear a response from us on what the outcome of that is at COP26 when we have a, a feature on, on zero emission trucks. Now, importantly, we've also published and consulted on a green paper, so a paper of options for how we regulate to deliver these phase out dates. Uh, and that's crucial. We've identified that we think that a ZEV mandate, a zero emission vehicle mandate, or a sales quota based on manufacturers in regulation is probably going to be our preferred solution. That will guarantee uh, industry and the private sector and those that are wanting to invest in the future infrastructure that this change is absolutely going to happen because it absolutely now, there's no suggestion with regulation that we're going to ban any kind of technology. We're not going to ban engines in the UK or anything like that. We're not saying the solution has to be one single technology. We are not pushing or putting all of our eggs into the battery basket. Green hydrogen is certainly in the mix for the transport. And we're really clear on that in the transport decarbonisation plan. Firstly, it's got to be green as hydrogen, but that's going to be in high demand across the economy. Uh, so we think it can be best used in all of the places that batteries can't be used. Definitely. A little bit more, but potentially, I mean, for hydrogen, it's probably the crucial, most crucial role of all decarbonizing all of those really hard or heavy duty transport applications that we've got trucks, buses, ships, planes, uh, possibly filling in gaps on the, on the railways where it's too expensive to put overhead wires, under bridges, and through tunnels, and all of that. Kind of thing. So, whilst decarbonizing our roads, as I've said, uh, tackles 90% of our emissions at source and it is essential, it's not enough. Pre-pandemic, road traffic uh, was predicted to grow in the UK by 30% over the next decade. Now, we haven't got space for that. Uh, so we do need to reduce our car dependency. More cars means more congestion, that means more pollution at the moment, and it also means lower productivity and a more sluggish economy. So there are a quarter of all the car journeys, all, all, a quarter of all private car journeys in the UK are under two miles. So we think that is uh, not necessarily a problem, but a huge opportunity for us to do things differently. So a key throughout the plan uh, is moving people away from cars or from using cars in particular for those shorter journeys and for longer journeys then trying to encourage people to public transport railways for example. Um, let's touch on cycling and walking. Uh, massive increases, a meteoric in fact increase in the use of cycling and walking during, uh, during lockdown and during, during the pandemic. Cycling rates last year are actually rose by 46 percent in the UK, which is huge, and it was the only transport mode that saw an increase uh, for understandable reasons, but that increase really is fantastic. There were a million more people last year in the UK that took a walk for leisure. That's awesome, that's fantastic. 
we want to build on that. We really want to inspire people today and future generations to make more recycling. And we've actually stated that we're going to invest to deliver that. by 2030. We want half of all journeys to be cycled. That's a half of all journeys to be cycled. That's a huge ambition. Um, that's the key to unlocking improvements in congestion as well as the environment. Um, so we'll leave behind hopefully convert those people from using a private car to cycle and walk, uh, to leave more space on the roads for those people with journeys that really do need to be So we're making huge investments in that, two billion it is over the next three or four years. We've got three hundred infrastructure projects making space safe, making more space and making that space safe on the site basis. The three hundred projects that started in just the last couple of months alone. Um, more safer space, frankly, includes more people. Uh, big investments in buses as well, huge pledge to reform the industry. You can't just tell people or ask people to take the bus if it's if it's more of a problem, if it's more difficult, if there aren't buses there, if they're dirty or more expensive. So we're making buses more reliable for people, more frequent and more modern. And of course, all of that means cleaner, quieter and nicer if there's zero emission. There's 4,000, over 10% of the fleet in the next two or three years is going to be replaced in the UK uh, and replaced by fully zero emission. That's fantastic. Uh, so we've got to make more sustainable options the better option for people. Can't just expect people to, to, to change their behaviours unless actually the options available are better. Um, now we sometimes get accused of being technology optimists, both ministers uh, and senior officials in the UK uh, when we talk about climate change. But frankly, I don't mind that, and, and I'm reasonably comfortable with it. There's going to be huge changes and huge developments between technology between now and 2050, it is actually a long time away. If you look back 30 years to what the state of technology was then, uh, you know, the prospects of doing something like this you know, just didn't exist. So crucially, the transport, the technology that we need, and we need to be deployed in heavy use by 2050, is already out there. We don't need to invent batteries again. Uh, there are lots of very clever people and lots of big businesses that are going to make a lot of money out of making them even better and they're working hard right like now. We've got really good prospects in for green hydrogen uh, to fill in those gaps where batteries can't buy the future, and certainly in the future. Those heavier transport use cases, as I've said, such as aviation and maritime, uh, those modes can be zero emission by 2050. We absolutely can. There's a huge opportunity for businesses to, to look at those global markets. Um, so it's not just technology. We do need to see some of this behaviour change now, though, as I've said. More of those short journeys uh, made by cycling and walk, walking uh, and on the bus as well. More longer journeys by rail, high speed rail. Even. I hope that all those people are flying to Heathrow for COP26, then taking the train to Glasgow. I really do. Uh, for me, this is the you know this is the real challenge that we face. It's not a technology challenge. It's uh, bringing the public with us on this journey that we know we have to make. But these changes, it's up to us to to make sure that those journeys and lives are, for those people are, are better. So I'm really hopeful actually that we'll be able to do this. Now to finish. Um, I hope you're still with me. I hope you can still still hear me. I just want to say that you know this really is the was well, introduced to COP26 as you know, it's the last moment to really really test us. It's not too late. But for us now with this transport decarbonisation plan, this is the beginning actually. You know, it's not the end. It's really important that we keep checking out uh, the targets that we've set ourselves and keeping it in keeping making sure that it is in line with what's needed, not just across transport, but also in line with the rest of the economy. There's going to be bumps along the way. The entire economy is going to be bringing forward the final solution to climate change. Um, we've got to make sure that it continues to do what it, what it needs to do because it's just too important. We, we can't afford to fail, fail at this. Um, I think I'll just leave you with the thought it's we think it's 125 years since the link between carbon dioxide and global warming was first discovered. Uh, and in the future, there's a real risk that future generations will look back at us and say, well, but if you knew that, you knew it for so long, why on earth didn't you act faster? Um, they'll, you know, they'll, they'll say, well, why did you think it was okay to destroy the environment around us? Did you think that was a price worth paying for, for just travelling around, uh, for taking a short journey in a car, perhaps? Transport is currently, and I think will always be absolutely essential so to connect us, to allow us to do business, to allow us to enjoy our lives. Um, our plan doesn't change any of that. There's no curtailment of any of that. What it does, in fact, is ensure that we can keep on doing that and probably do more of it as well. Hopefully, we'll be able to do that more cheaply, more easily, and above all, uh, in a far more cleaner and less damaging way so we can live better uh, and, frankly, healthier.
easier and probably longer lives as well, create new jobs, of course, and building a more sustainable economy. And if we do all of that, then I'm really confident that we can save the planet, I guess. And I hope that's not too big a message to end with. And I am very sorry for the audio problems, but uh, I hope that was uh, okay with a quick run through of our transport decon plan. Um, we'll, I think you're staying on for questions, but we'll, we'll move, we'll move uh, right away to Quivine and hope our, hope our technology uh, uh, difficulties are behind us. So, Quivine, are you there? Thanks, Mark. And, and you are there. Great. Yes, I'm here. Uh, how you doing? And good morning, everybody. And uh, nice to hear from you, Bob. Um, and uh, what's reassuring, actually, um, from listening to, to, to Bob and what I could hear, uh, uh, there's no surprises. Um, I suppose we're aligned in, in many ways uh, in terms of the way we're, we're, we're approaching this challenge. Uh, so it is reassuring, but not surprising. But a lot of what, what Bob has said out there in terms of the UK's approach to this is, is replicated here uh, uh, on the island. So. Um, listen, first thing, thank you all um, and th thanks for the invitation to address my new title. Um, I've just moved across into the climate action area within the Department of Transport and my, my new division is called Climate Engagement. So uh, this is my first engagement, actually. Uh, so th that's good. That's a good start. Uh, and it's, it's a great opportunity, I suppose, to, to, to set out our stall. Uh, some of this, I'm sure people will have... Uh, be aware of uh, and, and so I just wanted to kind of set out perhaps some of the uh, some of the pieces and, and maybe where, where where we're going next in terms of in terms of the challenge but maybe just to set out what is that challenge first of all uh, in the transport sector and um, now I'm going to try and share a screen so this is where the technology <laughs> may might go pear-shaped but hey we, we'll give it a go because I do have some slides and I spent a bit of time uh, and uh, my dogs loved it yesterday uh, when I went through it. So um, uh, my children didn't. Um, so I'll just try and share this uh, with you here. Um, so can everybody see that? And I'll just try and... Um, yeah, that's visible, Queevee. And there we go. Can you see that? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Great. I think, hopefully everybody can see that. Um, so listen, what I'm, my plan is just to... If uh, the slide will move on. <laughs> okay, now it's working. Great. Um, okay, so just a, a, a quick overview of what I'm going to talk to here. Scale of the challenge. What are we committed to? Um, like we are committed and, and COP is coming up uh, in Glasgow. Looking forward to attending that on Transport Day on the 10th of November. I'm sure to see you there, Bob. Um, in terms of what are we committed to nationally and internationally around, around this uh, climate, peace and transport? Uh, how do we achieve it? We have plans, uh, we have a, a key plan, which is the Climate Action Plan, but, but there are other plans that are highly relevant here. Uh, what are the challenges and opportunities that we see and how is my department, Department of Transport, gearing up and government generally around this? Um, and then some of the kind of key milestones or key initiatives that are to watch out for, I suppose, over the, 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 the months ahead. And certainly uh, in listening to Bob, and I think everybody is aware of this, this is urgent. This is this is happening now, uh, and we need to kind of uh, get get things right and set things right. So that there, there needs to be a plan, and it needs to have a degree of urgency about it. Um, scale of the challenge, right? So, um, and I, I again, Bob would have mentioned some of this already, but and and, and in Ireland we're no different. Uh, transport represents about twenty percent of national emissions. Uh, so we're we're in this right. Um, uh, and we're a developed nation, we're part of a European trading bloc, we're part of a wider global effort, so everybody is in this, uh, in, is in this piece, including the transport sector. So um, the, uh, 
road transport represents about 80 percent of that uh, and within that you're looking primarily at, at sorry not primarily but private car use is 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 the main contributor here about 50 percent 90 percent from hdvs uh, 6.5 percent from, from vans and then your public transport is probably the, the lowest emitter uh, within that 20 percent right now we looked back at 2020 and uh, god knows we all remember uh, uh, how restricted things were in terms of our movements um, and over the course of that year okay three months where we were moving nine months where we our movements were fairly well restricted we achieved 14 percent reduction in transport emissions uh, so that gives you some sense where we're aiming for 51 um, percent uh, where we were locked down in a large part of, of last year, we achieved 14%. Okay, so there's, there's lots of nuance around that and, and, and that's fine, but it is a kind of a, it does jump out at you. Um, and then clearly in the, the decades ahead, uh, we're looking at significant uh, demographic growth. We're looking at significant economic growth, hopefully. Um, but, you know, the, the forecasts are there for, I think, sort of 8% growth in terms of, uh, population and economic growth uh, uh, is going to we're, we're bouncing back as an economy here and um, so we have to deal with decarbonization while uh, all that growth is happening so that's that's a sense of the scale of, of, of the, the challenge here what we're committed to internationally obviously we have uh, as a nation committed to the, the Paris Agreement we are uh, part of the, obviously the European Union uh, and, and uh, the Green Deal has set out the stall for Europe to push ahead um, uh, with, with decarbonisation across all sectors. Uh, in July, we had the, the latest um, iteration of, of that Green Deal, which is the thing called Fit for 55, which is about uh, delivering 55% by 2030. But the um, so there is a lot of work and a lot of commitment and a lot of targets being set across the board, uh, across every sector. Uh, so things are moving uh, at a pace here. Nationally, um, obviously, it's the key priority for, for government, climate, housing and health. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a top priority. Uh, and it's been given that level of resource and that level of bandwidth within the within the system the climate action plan and climate act itself are, are the kind of key instruments to deliver um all of it all of it committing to carbon neutrality by 2050 and then within that various goals but 51 percent broadly speaking reduction in 2030 by 2030. Now, the climate act 2021 some of you may be familiar with it for the first time makes it all legally binding across government. So I suppose the, the political cycle becomes irrelevant. The government cycle becomes irrelevant. You now have a commitment that's legally binding uh, in perpetuity, if you like. Um, so uh, th that's the level of, I suppose, commitment that's been made uh, politically across the board around this. And um, we're legally bound to deliver or we pay. Um, so how do we go about this? Um, so this is where it gets interesting, right? So what I'm saying here, I suppose, and, and, and this is no surprise, there is no easy kind of panacea. There's no pain-free way of doing this. There's no cost-neutral way of doing it. All aspects of society, all aspects of human behavior, all as aspects of the economy will be impacted by this um, because we have to. Um, now, there's various actions and, and the, the Climate Action Plan currently, I think it's about 600, you know, actions across the board uh, we're looking i think the last count for the climate action 2021 with around a thousand um, separate actions right so there's a lot of serious kind of thinking and serious uh, uh, thought gone into delivering on, on, on the commitments here in terms of transport uh, you're i suppose we're looking at this in terms of kind of longer term kind of 2050 and then your 2030 kind of more immediate uh, goals right um, and the, the longer term piece uh, is the difficult one. Sorry, they're all difficult. The longer term piece is around actually changing the way we live, uh, changing where we live, how we live, 
a sort of land use piece and in, integrating transport into the mix, making transport the first thing you consider rather than the last thing you consider when you're doing your planning um, in terms of uh, housing, etc. Now, housing for all is it, it um, you know, we're, we're getting there, we're getting uh, that, that message across, and the national planning framework is the instrument uh, that, that all government departments have signed up to uh, around that. So we will see that change happening, but it's a longer term uh, one, but it's absolutely essential. Um, again, enhanced public transport, a key element of this, and next week the, the, the revised national development plan will be announced, uh, Project 2040, people have seen that. So there is a, a vision for a future in terms of public transport, um, uh, subject to quite a financial kind of uh, investment, uh, but yes, and subject to a lot of planning issues. So we, we, we do continue to struggle with, with that in terms of public transport, but that is the vision uh, public transport to be uh, enhanced in terms of quality and quantity. Um, also, in terms of walking and cycling networks, you know, the active travel is a key element of this, and I'll talk to that later. Demand management um, is probably the most difficult piece of the whole equation here um, in terms of delivery, but it's one of the ones that we, we are, as a department, you know, spending a lot of time uh, looking at at the moment. There's a demand management study that was published uh, last, I think, earlier in the year. Uh, we'll have guidelines issuing shortly on the foot of a second report. Uh, in relation to that, so that a menu of options for local authorities and uh, many of the urban kind of areas looking at how, how you do the demand management piece. Um, and then in terms of the, the more immediate 2030 piece, obviously, you know, and no more than uh, Bob has set out, um, technology electrification is, is a key element of that. We're also increasing requirements around biofuels in the national fuel mix. Uh, that is that's an interim measure. It will not be the final solution by any means, but it's the way of getting there using existing uh, fleets uh, in the transport area. So it's achievable, but it's going to require a huge amount of uh, behavioral change uh, and the way we, we do things uh, go at government level and at all levels. Um, I suppose the key consideration, all of this is to minimize the costs for the most vulnerable in society and uh, easy saying that but when you look at energy prices etc and what's happening there um, you know that is a challenge uh, and then to avoid an inflicting and I know this is probably of most uh, importance to, to, to the audience here is not inflicting irreparable economic damage in the process so if we are an island uh, uh, on, on the periphery of Europe um, but highly dependent on exports highly depending on trade and uh, uh, Kind of free flow of goods, so uh, that is getting that bit right is is a challenge. Um, just uh, I suppose uh, the slide just sets out some of the the kind of in a kind of more graphic way what I've just been talking about there. But if you even look at that modal hierarchy and modal shift is, is the kind of one of the key kind of concepts in all of this in terms of transport, and it's easy to say it, and it's a um, side harder to achieve it, but what we're looking at is actually reversing um, you know, modal choices from the private car to active travel and public transport. So you you choose to walk, you choose to cycle, you choose your your electric bike, your e-scooter when it's legal. Uh, you choose all these means of uh, moving around. Uh, yeah first and then you look at public transport and the last thing you talk and look at is, is taking out your car if you're going to have a car make sure it's electrical so like that is the that's you know in terms of how we do things currently that's a complete reversal um, so we are looking at 100 percent of new car sales we're looking at greater level of biofuel blending in the you know short term we're looking at a massive ramping up in transport, public transport availability, the quality and quantity of that, getting people walking, getting people active, um, and then the demand management piece, obviously, and there's various, and those little icons there hide the, the, the pain <laughs> that demand management actually means, but higher fuel prices, toning, taxing, uh, and congestion charging, higher parking, and working from home. 
So we were looking at the monsters are doing that. Uh, so that's going to be easier. But. So yeah, so um, what are the challenges and opportunities? And again, I just wanted to kind of summarize it here, capture it uh, really in, in the key, key elements of this uh, and, and looking at what we're targeting for 2030. Uh, what those kind of opportunities and challenges might be, but I suppose that these are long -term, longer term challenges and opportunities as well. So growth, I've talked to that, right? So there is a huge that's economic growth and population growth coming at us, right? That's happening. It's inevitable. Um, so we're we're trying to do this while while um, while you know demand for transport will actually increase. Um, so uh, you know public engagement around how how we do that and how we, we uh, convince people that you know, those to make different choices and uh, it's got to be a key challenge and opportunity and um, technology wise obviously there's the intentions to have a million uh, EVs by 2030 do we have the production levels do we have the supply of green electricity uh, right now we don't clearly um, but there's a pace and a, a level of investment that's happening both in Ireland and internationally around this. So we're optimistic, but it's a challenge. It's, it's a stretch target. Um, their EVs in the private sector are obviously, or for private cars, are, are well advanced in terms of technology. For HGVs, less so. And Bob talked to that. And I suppose that's where the, the nuance comes in in terms of you know what our expectations are around uh, the, the the freight sector here, because that is a that is a that will be a, a challenge. Kind of moving to hydrogen, where that technology isn't as mature <clears throat> as it should be, or as it could be, uh, and hopefully it will be uh, when we need it. And um, I've talked to biofuels already, and it's the invisible measure, and it's very effective, um, and it is the way out for a lot of kind of legacy kind of internal combustion fleets uh, right now it is it is delivering kind of abatements that are that are necessary but it's not the long-term solution here by any means um, and then the last bit is kind of actually removing 25 percent uh, of car journeys uh, out of the mix uh, that's pretty significant uh, that, that's a real challenge but that's down to actually um, uh, there's a political issue there. There's demand management. There's all that uh, has, to, has to fall into place uh, to deliver that level of, of, of uh, conversion from existing ice kilometers, as in internal combustion uh, kilometers, to to uh, to take those out of the mix over the next ten years. So, um, how are we gearing up? I suppose in terms of this department. Um, Transport we have ramped up. Um, this was on part of that. Uh, in terms of personnel, in terms of resource, in terms of commitment, I suppose uh, transport is stepping up and has been stepping up. Um, and it's the key priority for. We have a minister who's also who's a minister of transport, also a minister of climate. Um, uh, so it is the key priority in, in our department right now. Um, we hold the levers as a department for a lot of the public transport spend. Um, so we, we can and we are kind of delivering across you know, the active travel and public transport and road side of that. Um, we are leading in terms of policy development on biofuels and aviation maritime. Uh, we share the minister. We share a minister with, with the climate department. Government wise, it is the top priority. It's structurally, there's a cabinet, there's a cabinet committee. And there's a lot, I would say, of, of resource being pumped into getting this right, uh, in, particularly in the area of research, particularly in the area of bringing in you know, the latest thinking and the latest kind of academic kind of uh, uh, brain power to, to make this work, and to, make it, to make the right decisions. That's what the key piece of this is actually in terms of technology, for example, it's at what point do you, does the state stop investing or start investing and hitting the, the kind of sweet spot where you're incentivizing the, uh, the market to get involved in experimental technology or in technology that isn't quite as mature as they would like. So spreading that risk in a way that works for everybody, um, that's a challenge. 
Uh, I mentioned the Climate Act already, and the Climate Action Plan is, is the kind of key instrument as well so across government around this. Finally, um, just some of the key milestones ahead, um, and just to, 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 I mentioned already, National Development Plan, we have one. There's a revision of that, a review of that has been happening over the summer, um, and, and there will be kind of additional uh, announcements to be made next year or next, next week in relation to the National Development Plan, in particular in terms of transport. So watch out for that one. Budget 2021, um, obviously in terms of the carbon, carbon tax, etc. you know, well, that's already been announced. So uh, but there, there, there may well be elements of, of further kind of climate related, that there will be climate related actions uh, in, in the budget. I uh, can't talk about them, obviously, but the um, Climate Action Plan by the end of October is the current time frame for, for the, the, the latest iteration of that Climate Action Plan. There is a Climate Action Plan. It's revised probably every year, I think, at this point. Uh, and this 2021 is, and it links to the commitments around COP, it links to everything, and it's about ramping up uh, the level of delivery um, uh, so it is a kind of step change, actually, in terms of the previous climate action plans. It will be uh, finalised by the end of October. That, again, that's cross government. That's not just transport, but transport is a big component of it. Um, COP26 um, and UK are hosting that this year in, in, in Glasgow. Uh, and obviously, it's, it's a rallying point as much as anything around, you know, what needs to be done. And you know, getting developed countries in particular to you know step up. Um, sustainable mobility policy, uh, and again, that that's falls on, on, on partly on my side of the house. Uh, there is a lot of work happening in relation to development of sustainable mobility policy. Some people around may remember what was called the smart travel policy. This is the the next iteration of that, and it's intended to capture a lot of what's happening within the Climate Action Plan and look ahead 20 uh, years ahead around that. Fit for 55, I already mentioned, is the EU um, piece, and that is, uh, there's a lot in that, and I suppose we've kind of started our negotiation process with the Commission, with, with the, the, the Council and the European Parliament around, there's a, I can't recall precisely how many different legal files are involved here but you're talking about 10 to 15 different elements of legislative files that are working through the system all of which are intended to ramp things up um, in terms of commitments and targets and getting things right um, over the next 10 years and finally and my secretary general is a big fan of the alliterating points so i thought of it Throw this last slide in, just to kind of <laughs> to summarise, right? So, uh, firstly, and as Bob said, you know, we're kind of beyond the rhetoric, right? Uh, we're beyond, hopefully, trying to argue the science, but it is about the planet. And it's you know, stupid, but it is about the planet. Um, everybody has a vested interest in this. This is about everybody contributing something. Uh, and delivering their best around what they can do here. Um, there's no need to panic yet. We've seen what happens when panic kicks in across the water. It doesn't, people behave in a very perverse way. So there's no need to panic. There is plan, of, in fact, there's various plans. We have, there are a lot of plans. There's a lot more coherence around those plans. And I'm sure people would point out maybe, you know, inconsistencies in various plans, but there's a level of coherence that hasn't been there and a level of commitment to a plan or a plan that's unprecedented. It's right now, I suppose, and to Bob's point earlier, it's about pace. It's about stepping up the pace. It's about delivering things quicker uh, over the next 10 years so we get things delivered. Uh, public engagement is, is going to be a big element of this, and this is the demand management piece, this is the kind of political piece, this is all about changing the way people think about it and behave and actually getting that right. Uh, we can't do that without actually engaging with people and, and being, being frank and honest about it. Uh, I suppose as a reassuring piece, the uh, reassuring P is a pragmatic P, is about you know, we're moving away from that dogmatic kind of idealistic piece here and we're moving into like 
action orientated stuff how do we actually do things and being pragmatic what will work what won't work trying stuff out if it doesn't work try something else that's the pragmatism that's needed now actually uh, and the payoff you can look at your kids you can look at your dogs you can look, you know, look around you and you, you will have contributed something a payoff uh, is actually you know a vision of an ireland and a, and a world where you know it, it may actually persist and uh, we may actually get through this but also in terms of you know the active travel piece and the healthier kind of way of living um, and that you know less consumer driven kind of piece all of that you know there is a payoff in, in everything we're doing here uh, that's a kind of quality of life thing hard to measure um, but that should be the and that's it thank you very much and I think I've gone well over time uh, apologies for that um, th thanks Quivine. Um just um, we're behind time everybody sorry I um, we're behind time, everybody, so we'll, 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 we'll keep going. Um, I won't introduce the panel. They can introduce themselves when, when I've asked them a question. Um, but what I'm hearing is uh, from Bob and Quivine is there's some low-hanging fruit, there's some much tougher areas, but uh, indeed a lot of it is about shaping our future and, and winning the hearts, of, hearts and minds of the, the community, both um, um within the UK and Ireland to, to make that change happen. And that's obviously a huge behavioural change, which is always difficult. Um, if I can turn to an, uh, to an optimistic note, um, but uh, you, you're the, you uh, are CEO of Rightbus and you've, and you've actually delivered on the first hydrogen-powered double-decker buses. Perhaps you might tell us why you went ahead with that and, and the benefits it's brought to your company. So good morning and thank you. Um, I, I think first of all, it, it's worth noting that you know, Wrightbus was zero emissions over ten years ago, both battery and hydrogen. So hydrogen vehicles were running around London on Route Seven, I think it was, for over ten years, and only recently came out of commission. And battery electric buses again, you know, were delivered into the market over ten years ago. So technology-wise and, and ambition-wise, the bus manufacturers, especially Wright Bus, have had zero emissions front and centre. But, you know, recently, as everybody's aware, Wright Bus went into administration two years ago. And when we took over, um, the, the main um, look at it was the fact that it was a zero-centric organisation. Most of the product was being launched and when we went to speak to our customers they also said that there needs to be a balance between hydrogen and battery electric so we've launched both technologies into the market and what advantage does that give us well it gives us you know a look at the market going forward it means that we're investing in 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 the future it means that we're attracting the right type of people into the organization it means that we're meeting our customers' needs and demands. It also helps us communicate to government and explain where the direction of travel should be going with regards to transport. And we're doing it not because we're a, an idle by bystander, but an active member and participant in the zero emissions conversation. We have invested. We are contributing. We are trying to do our bit for, for zero emissions technology. And most of all, it's creating jobs. You know, we've gone from two years ago, 50, 50, just below 50 people in a, in a business that was in an administration to last year, um, 700 people. And now we're aiming for 900 people and, and we're recruiting actively into business. And that's just not uh, bus uh, manufacturers or bus assemblers, but that's designers, accountants, salespeople, all across the board, all across the intellectual and kind of structural part of the business. And, you know, I, I think that's the key thing in all of this is zero emissions does drive growth in organisations. It does drive uh, uh, ambition. It does drive the right type of people joining the organisation. It does drive growth. 
It, it's a brilliant story and, and really uplifting because everybody, I think, is sometimes you can get overwhelmed by the challenge of decarbonization, but you're, you're living proof that it's so many benefits and so many opportunities if if you if you take the right uh tight right right road and apologies for the uh, terrible pun um and richard you're you're you've got a greater challenge i think you you know you're a long long distance transport company it's all he- heavy goods as i understand it we've spoken in the past about you you know you kind of get not brand off about being told what 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 works in your sector when you know it doesn't and i suppose what we need to try and find is a way forward to find a solution to that, to, to your industry. Um, how do we bridge the gap from what is currently capable to what might be, what might be um, fully achievable by 2030? And how perhaps can we get there between industry and government? Mark? Um, yeah. Our, our end is, is probably the, the harder end. And having listened to, uh, to Bob and Dean there, um, Bob's, Bob's uh, piece, I, I can barely hear, but I heard something about hydrogen in the background. And Quivine's, uh, to be fair to him, he knows it's a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a harder area. So look, um, when it comes to our sector, you're moving 20 plus tons of product. And um, torque and mathematics are gods. That's, that's what drives it. I can't see us going back onto the canals and things like that. But if that would work, we'd be on them. Um, so from what I could decipher listening to the presentations is there's no real pathway for us right now. Does that mean we're negative? It does not. Not at all. There are two or three things we can do in the interim, um, I think, to get there. But um, electric just doesn't work for us right now. Now, the hydrogen, Buta, that was interesting, what he was saying about the buses. Uh, a lot of the buses, they start on a milk run. In other words, they start at a point, they finish back at that same point. In our case, they go from a point to another point, and, and you might see the same driver for four days. Maybe we'll have to change our way, but the costs associated with this will be huge, I, I would think. And if, if the driver thing that you're seeing going on at the minute is anything to go by, you're talking 100% of cost, I would have thought. So I don't know if that answers your question, Mark, the first part of it. Is that is that the first part? Yeah, I, what I'm really trying to, I, I understand it's really tr- difficult. Yeah. And what I'm trying to get to is, is, is there a way of aligning industry and government and providing a, a route map to a solution? There is, okay? And even this, this, this audience, these are business people. A lot of them are in manufacturing or associated with manufacturing. Now, the difference between, uh, and it's the British Irish share of commerce, but, but the difference between the Irish story and the British story, we have businesses in both. So Ireland are a net exporter of goods. They really do. It's like a mini Germany. Britain, not the same, really. It, it's, it's more contained within that island. Um, the fact that we're one of their biggest export markets says it all. We're only, you know, an island of six or seven million people. So the, the reality is that there's a different, the Irish story and the British story is not the same in terms of freight. There is no international um, HEV company really in Britain anymore. That got done away with once uh, the Single European Act happened. That may change now in a few years' time, but we'll see how it goes. In Ireland, if we just focus on the Ireland thing, so there is an alternatively fueled HDV purchase grant, okay? And it was in Quibine's um, jigsaw, um, the, the latter part of his presentation. It's probably the only thing that's there for us, but it doesn't, it doesn't work. So it's for electric vehicles. They don't work in our sector. It, it, they're not proved. Um, they just, if they worked, we would be using them. Gas doesn't work. Um, Hydrogen is interesting, but most of the manufacturers of HGV trucks have parked their hydrogen plants on trucks. They are doing it on buses, but they parked it on trucks, kicked it down the road for 10 years. And on trucks, because of the torque, um, they, they, they're, they're definitely going down a pathway of diesel fuel. Okay? 
so be it. If that's what it is, that's what it is. But the reality is we, we've already put it to government um, and been ignored and been ignored again. And I suspect when the budget comes out in a week's time, we will be ignored again, uh, whereby you can put capital allowances out for the, the Irish fleet. The same, the, the, on the British side, they've done this. They put capital allowances out for fleet renewal. Well, it's for, it's for capital allowances, not just for fleet renewal, it's for everything. We could do that and encourage Euro 6 and Euro 7s. Euro 7 trucks don't exist yet. Euro 7 trucks, as they're made available into the marketplace, they would save, uh, the, they eliminate pretty much all knocks and socks, gone. Um, they reduce the amount of diesel oil by 30%, the later models. And even if one was really serious, if one was really serious about this thing, about this fuel, then you would make something like HVO, hydrated vegetable oil, available today. We don't need to wait 20 years or 10 years or 10 days. It will work in a Euro 6 truck with no modifications whatsoever. So every one of those goes in. That comes from rapeseed, for instance. It works today. But the duty, when you use that product for making food product, that's fine. But when you make that product and put it in a fuel, then there's duty on it and it just makes it, it can't work. It doesn't work money-wise. So what, what I'm saying, I suppose, is it's there. There are things we can do on that 50% reduction. In my head, there's a good shot at it, but unless government do their job, we can't do a job. The last point I'll make is we do not make the trucks and we do not make the fuels, but we use them. No, thanks, Richard. I mean, that's 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 illuminating. And um, if I could if I could turn to uh, Lucy, um, sorry, Kate, my apologies. Um, if, in terms of bringing people together, obviously, it looks like there's a, a disjoint. How would you see us finding a solution in terms of the transport sector and the, you, you know, we've spoken about the interconnectedness of sectors. How would you see that working in terms of in terms of finding solutions? Uh, so, big question. Um, <laughs> yeah. no, an, easy one um, an easy one to start you off. <laughs> so, I'll just answer that in, in a heartbeat. Um, a, a very quick introduction, just for, for context. Um, Instinctive Partners is a, a business communications consultancy, and I lead our Reinventing Responsibility Services, which, which pulls together our sustainability and ESG offering across the sort of the whole stakeholder spectrum. Um, so hence my, my interest and absolute belief in um, collaboration and, and, and coming to answers together. And I think when we're looking at decarbonisation, we have to think of the power of and. It's really easy to think in, in small silos um, and look at all of the paradoxes that we're trying to overcome. But I think we have to take sector approaches and we have to collaborate and take a systems view. So we take responsibility for our own sector and we look how we can help other sectors. So for, for the transport sector in particular, you know, the, the transport sector's scope one emissions are the, the rest of the world's scope three emissions. And actually, they're also quite easy, um, easy, simple. It's possible now to track that data and have that data and have a really good understanding where those emissions are coming from. So we're in a really strong position to move forward to reduce. And I think one of the things that... Um, that Bob said earlier that I, that I wrote down, um, actually, but was every gram of carbon counts. And I think it's really easy to discount the small things. And we think, well, you know, that's negligible. Why bother? But actually, what we can do now, it's like saving for a pension. Even if you put in a little bit early on, um, you, you know, you reap the re rewards at the end. So let's let's make the small changes now. And so with, with freight transport, you know, it, it, it could be packaging solutions somewhere down the track different packaging, less plastic, smaller piece of uh, item per unit, a couple of less pallets on a, on a truck. So we reduce um, the actual amount of, of, of trucks on the road and the weight of the, of the load. So really small things like that. Um, I think the, the, the Marines have a nice um, saying in, in, in the US, the difficult we do straight away, the impossible takes longer. And um, you know th th this is not impossible but it is very difficult. And I think having the mindset that we can do it, um, but that we will only do it by really changing everything. And, and that's not a problem. 
it's not necessarily even a cost. It's just a different way of looking at things. So we have new opportunities, new markets, new industries, new technology. Um, and we don't know what it all is yet. So that's scary. Um, but together, we, we, we can do it. And I think without the togetherness, we can't, is my personal view. I think that's absolutely right. And, and we've talked about a just, just transition. So much will come down to if you get outside the, the commercial sector, if you like it, and into the homes and activities of people, behavioral psychology, we, we nearly always seem to come back to it when we talk about the energy transition, because it's such a big factor in, in winning those hearts and minds and changing those behaviors. Is, is there an easy route to do that? Or where do we find those indicators and, and incentivize people to, as, as, um, Queeving spoke about, you know, getting onto their walking, getting into their it, it, uh, onto onto uh, bicycles rather than driving the two kilometres to the shops and things like that. How how do we incentivize people to do that in, in a way that works? Uh, uh, Louise, or Kate, sorry, why do I keep on calling you? Uh, my apologies, I, it's now in my brain. Sorry, Kate, my apologies. It's still, still one for me. I, I mean, I, I imagine Lorraine will have a view on this. I think, I, I think it's data, 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 data. I know that's a little bit dull, um, but if we don't understand why people are using transport now and for what, um, then we can't put in place a different way of, of being. Um, so um, Caroline Corrado Perez has a, a, a whole chapter on transport in her brilliant book called Invisible Women, which which talks about the different ways that, that that perhaps men and women using stereotype gender definitions here are using transport and how it works for men, but it doesn't work for women. Um, and we, but we don't have the data. We don't have the data for how everybody is using transport. Um, and, and we need to get that because when, when we do, we can understand how we can cut um, journey times. We can cut kilometers on roads. We can cut, um, the, the emissions that go with that, but we can also make people's lives better and easier. So we, we must look after the most vulnerable in society. It has to be a, a just transition. And I, I, I do believe that if we look at this as an as an opportunity, I think look at the, 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 the sustainable development goals, the UN sustainable development goals. If we implement those by 2030, it's it's worth $12 trillion um, of um, new business opportunity. Um, it, they've been called a purchase order from the future. Um, so, so again, it's mindset shift for, for us as business people and, and, and as policymakers as well, um, because consumers, if you like, we're all people, we're all consumers, but we, we say that we will pay more for a sustainable solution, but we actually don't and we won't. So it's not about asking people to pay more. It's about finding better solutions or even cheaper solutions that happen to deliver the carbon benefits that we're looking for. Now, I, I know that sounds like, you know, a, the moon on a stick. Um, but but to Bob's point, again, being a technology optimist, you know, innovation is is happen, happening rapidly. It's happening now. We've seen Ford only this week confirm $11 billion worth of investment in two new battery um, sites in, in, in the US. Um, and that's part of a 30 billion investment. So so it's it's investment like that. It's It's action that's actually happening. Um, right now that will deliver the change um, and, and, and affordably. It, it has to. There's no other way that will work. Yeah, I think the technology providers will have a huge, huge, huge role, role in that. Uh, and, but also, you're right. I mean, it's understanding the motivations for people using the particular modes of transport. Until we do that, it's very hard to get them to change that, change that motivation or give them a different motivation. Um, Robert, you, you, you've been you've been uh, waiting patiently there. Um, obviously, uh, your uh, company Volkswagen is a huge um, player in the transport sector. I mean, we've we've heard about Ford, but in terms of you might outline just what Volkswagen is doing to change the, the technologies that will be used now and in the future. So. Thanks, Mark. Good morning. And Quivian, I'm not sure if you're still on the call, but I wish you um, every success in your new role in, in climate engagement. Uh, Volkswagen have invested 73 billion um, in battery electric vehicle technology, hybrid technology. Uh, hydrogen, by the way, does form a part of that. But realistically, 
I think it would be the 2030s uh, before you'd see that uh, in domestic cars. I'm aware there are some manufacturers testing hydrogen uh, in HGV vehicles. Um, so it's, it's, it's a, very much a mandate uh, from our parent company, Volkswagen AG, uh, and it's a big part of our story in Volkswagen in Ireland. Uh, we have 40% of the market in Ireland. Uh, last year, we only had a, a small portion of it, but really 2021 has been the year where the ID3, the ID4, um, Audi e-trons in, uh, in greater volumes has happened. And that's despite shortages due to, due to semiconductors and so on. Uh, so it's a really big part of it. And just to come back to Richard's point about uh, what's realistic, um, Scania, which is, a, which is a, um, a truck company that's owned by Volkswagen, uh, is joining the Amazon and Global Optimization um, uh, Forum. And they have committed to zero carbon emissions by 2040, uh, which is 10 years ahead of the Paris uh, uh, Climate Agreement uh, requirement. So there is a, there is a, a desire, there's investment, uh, there's a willingness from Volkswagen and automotive in general uh, to be a part of this. Um, and to come back to your point at the start, Mark, you said some of this will be uh, short-term measures, some will take longer. Uh, and there's another point that Bob made as well, um, and I support his point that it can't be overstated how serious this is. Uh, it will require huge changes, which are technically difficult and politically difficult. And I think, you know, some of us as stakeholders are unhappy about this. Uh, Richard mentioned the upcoming budget. It's no secret. Uh, the motor business is not happy about it, but it is about stakeholder management. The government are a stakeholder. Automotive is a stakeholder. Uh, so we need to work together uh, to achieve the art of the possible. Uh, I, I think that's abs abs absolutely right. Lorraine, Lorraine we heard uh, from Quivine that 50% of all transport emissions are, are through private vehicles. And you, you've um, championed the, the concept of the 15-minute the village. Can you maybe give us an outline of what, the, what, what that means and, and what, the, what we can do in the future to achieve that? Yeah, so um, thanks very much. The 15-minute the um, city has become a bit of a buzzword now for what we've, um, it's kind of essentially a fancy new phrase that's, that's going around, for, for what we've been living in up until the late, and what we've built up until the late 20th century. It is that compact village and that village could be Greenwich Village in New York with thousands of people living in it, or it can be a rural village of 40, 50 people even. Um, and it is the idea that you can attain all your daily needs on foot or easily attain it and that, you know, your, your, your weekly needs are served. But you can also then access good public transport to take you to wherever else you need to go. And that's how we lived. That's how it was until late 20th century when we started to build what I call car architecture, where there was an assumption made that everybody had access to a car. And, you know, so we then generated these car dependent neighborhoods where people became more socially isolated. And we know this, the data is showing us, the research is showing us people are more socially isolated. People are um, not as fit and healthy. They don't know their neighbors. They, um, and, you know, on the flip of that, what we there was research in Toronto that showed that if you live in a walkable neighborhood, you, the onset of dementia is eight years later than in if, you, if you live in a non-walkable neighborhood. There is fundamentally fundamental links to social, mental um, uh, health and well-being, but um, also to carbon emissions because, you know, people who live in these car dependent suburbs, they use their cars more. And even when we stratify that for socioeconomic status, you know, poorer people living in low walkable neighborhoods earn less money, right? Because, you know, like walk walkable neighborhoods do cost a little bit more, even though deprived ones, um, but they spend more on fuel. So they're, they're in a cycle of transport poverty. So there are real social implications for this. And as Kate mentioned, it, like, you know, we've only collected data. We really only focus on the data around the commute. In Ireland, we do have our household travel survey, but it's a relatively small sample. It doesn't give us a full picture of how people travel. And um, when we only focus on the commute, we, we, we don't pick up those, you know, we talk about most of these journeys being less than two kilometers. The why, why are people who are traveling less than two kilometers sitting in their private car? And that is down to the fact that we've, our neighborhoods are now less walkable. 
And as I said, you know, we have these villages, these urban and rural villages that we all used to live in before we can move around in, but we now need to move back in and incentivize moving back into them and retrofitting them to be fit for purpose. We have an, an incredible amount of derelict properties within these neighborhoods. Um, we have neighborhoods that are completely segregated and sliced by a really heavily trafficked road where people can cross. So therefore they will go and go sit in their car instead. So they, so when it comes to addressing our climate emissions and our impacts, that we um, we have to think about the micro as well as the macro. And you know, the, a lot of the conversation has focused on the macro, and um, you know, and the technologies, and you know, the, and these are not to be dismissed. It is not, like you know, you understandably change people fear change. So the likes of Richard and his company, of course, they're going they're, they're going to fear change. You know, that is you know, it, 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 this is it. It, it. It's a scary time for all of us right now, um, in relation to the climate. Um, to, to climate and everything that's involved in it. And we're just coming out of a very scary time um, in COVID. But one of the pluses on COVID was that over 80% of the Irish population was regularly walking within five kilometres of their homes. So they have now experienced what is available on their doorstep. They know what the local shops are. They know where the deficiencies are in their neighbourhood in relation to being able to cross roads or not. And hopefully we can learn from that and get people more familiar. They know their neighbours more, um, etc. So, yeah, change. We have to address the change, but we have to think about those as well as that, that macro, we have to think about the micro. And Quivian covered quite a lot of that. And, you know, and it's great to see, that, you know, this has been taken on board by uh, Department of Transport, Climate Action Council, like you know, um, Climate Action Group. There's a lot of interdisciplinary conversations around this, which has been um, really important. And another point in that that Kate had mentioned as well, that it ha we have to um, we have to like break down the silos, and that's something that you know we're we're doing here in TU Dublin, where we have a multidisciplinary masters in sustainable transport mobility, where we have truck drivers as well as planners as well as people from IT all coming in and working together, and you know being creative in the solutions because you know many policies have unintended consequences. And we don't always see them unless we look at them with a transport lens or whatever lens it was. For example, an example I quite often use is the privatization of our bin trucks. We've done with very good reason and rationale for doing it. But what it has done is increased the number of heavy goods vehicles within our communities, therefore making it less safe for children to play on the street or to be out to walk to school on their own, etc. So we don't always think about our policies and look through them in a proper lens. And we also have that gender lens. We have that equality lens that we don't look at. We don't look at how are we inconveniencing older people in being able to access public transport, for example. You know, would they have a great need for using public transport? Um, so, yeah, it's about... Um, you know, it, it's about having this diversity of views, but that local, those local trips, we need to, um, we need to really invest in those local trips and the walkability of our neighbourhoods and our good public transport, including rural public transport. We have to invest in rural public transport. And in in that, I, I nearly have two questions for you. One, one is, um, we in Ireland at least have a very dispersed rural community and actually i'm going to combine the two questions nearly we also the built environment more evolves rather than changes radically you know it takes 25 years to 50 years for it to change or to modernize a house for example you probably only do it if you're refurbishing a house once every 25 years at tops and um, how what policy change would you like to see that would speed up and incentivize people to accelerate that change to allow, the, uh, to implement what you're saying, because I understand what you're saying and I, I get it, but I'm just wondering from a government policy point of view, is there, what would you like to see happen that would incentivize that change? Um, so, well, I'm delighted to say that they seem to be listening to us, <laughs> which is a good start. <laughs> and that's why we like to provide these for for us. <laughs> which is great. Um, so first of all, look, the massive investment in walking and cycling, um, you know, the 365 million per annum and globally, because I'm involved in a lot of like um, sustainable transport and um, active travel um, groups internationally. And we're being seen as a leader in this space and, um, you know, the provision of active travel teams now within our local authorities. And I'm, I'm really excited for where this is going to take us. Um, um, but and rural public transport, I think they're two of the key things. When we look back to now, and 
I am I'm one of those people. I grew up six miles in the nearest village. I grew up in the back arse of beyonds, as we would say in Ireland. So I, I'm very familiar <laughs> with this concept. But like things like um, opening up the school transport system to be more inclusive, because at the moment you have to live a certain distance from uh, from a village before you can access the school transport. If we can get children onto school buses, that removes four car trips less than two kilometers, probably two to six kilometers off the road every day. If we can then um, get good public transport links between our small villages and towns, that then takes more of those small trips off. And we need to think about rural transport as being, as being more than the bingo bus. We need to think about it being, you know, you know, our, rural, our current rural public transport was brought on board as a social measure, not a transport measure a social equity measure. So we now have to take it seriously as a transport measure. Uh, one of our students has been doing a piece of research and he noted when he started looking at small villages in Ireland, he noticed that some of them had, um, you know, as, as low as 30% car ownership in some of those, in some of these villages and from their households, but yet had no public transport provision. Um, so, and we can we can pretty quickly like I know what you're saying about you know some things are slow to go like metros are slow <laughs> we know metros slow um and public like I remember working on Lewis you know like nearly 15 years before one of the lines went in but um the thing is retrofitting our urban environments can be a quick fix there are places where we literally have to knock down walls so people can walk to a bus stop closer so that they're not forced into sitting into the car because it's the easiest way to get to where they need to go um but we need community engagement and action and um ownership community ownership and awareness of their trips and how they can change their kilometers traveled and not just their own kilometers traveled the, the kilometers traveled within their household but also of the goods and services of which they are accessing as well and i think that we need to be media have a key role to play in this because there's so many uh, polarized um, de de debates and discussions which they don't need to be and they shouldn't be People should feel ownership of the decisions that they make and if for it not to be a controversial thing, for them not to feel like they, they're we're forcing them not to use their car. It's not that. It's not about um, denying someone the, it's owed, like ownership of a car if they so wish. It is about removing the necessity of owning a car to which for to do your daily needs and if you know for, for to do the trips that you need to do. I think that's a really good point. And, uh, you know, it, it's great to hear that, you know, the, there's that enthusiasm and, and that the easy wins, as I say, the, the joined up thinking that we can, we can implement, implement some changes really quickly. Others will take more time, but there's still lots of things that we can achieve in, in the short term. I'm really conscious that it's, uh, we kind of run on. It's 25 minutes past. We are supposed to finish up, I think, at a half past. Um, Paul, just turning to you, is there any questions or themes of questions coming through that we might just finish up with? Yeah, so the, the, we won't get uh, we won't get all the questions. And um, one of them was about budget twenty twenty. What, what panelists would like to see from it, or from government more generally, to support the decarbonisation uh, gender uh, agenda. Pardon me. Uh, and are the targets for the transport sector fair? And in your opinion, will we reach our 20, 30, 20, uh, 50 uh, targets? And then there's some specific ones for speakers, but we may have run out of time. And. Um I tell you what, if I could just ask the pa panel very quickly in, in, in a very short uh, sentence or, we, or for a short reply, we had uh, Emma Pinchbeck, uh, the Energy UK uh, CEO on, and she called this, uh, uh, which really it struck with me, the, the decade of delivery. We've got to deliver this um, this decade to try and achieve our, our carbon, carbon, our decarbonisation goals. Um, and... I suppose if I could ask each of the panelists, and starting with with Butter, and um, if you had to if you had to pick one key thing that you'd like to see, what would it be and why? And if we can keep just, I'm conscious of time, so you you probably got thirty seconds each to give your response. So, Butter, over to you. If you're not on mute, Butter. Sorry, um, I think that's the problem. We just can't keep focusing on one key thing. What we have to integrated transport policy. You know, for example, you know, if you have priority bus lanes and reduce the travel time by five minutes, it has a direct impact with the number of people that go on a bus. If you then invest in those buses and make them zero emissions and make them quiet and places that people want to be, again, has a big impact. If you have an infrastructure 
that supports hydrogen and an EV that allows trucks and buses to go on it, again, it will encourage further. What we need is coordination on a number of departments. I'll give you a very good example. In the UK, there's a good policy that says the government wants 4,000 zero emission buses by uh, the end of the parliament. They've got another good policy that says they want to spend 240 million on, on um, infrastructure, but they don't connect the two. So by not connecting the two, you don't get acceleration, you just get isolation. And what we need to do more and more is look at how you can make the largest impact in the shortest amount of time and concentrate the money and coordinate those activities. And I think, you know, with some of the things that we've heard about the locality and using transport and using public transport more and more, that then allows cars to do what they're, you know, the essential journeys rather than all journeys. And that, that's, a, that's a transformation that we really need. I think that's a brilliant answer. And uh, thanks for drawing me out of my bad questions. So uh, <laughs> thank you for that. Um, Chase, maybe, maybe I could turn to you and, and would you give your uh, response to that question? I kind of like to say what Buddha said, actually, <laughs> as, my, as my answer. But just in, in, terms, in terms of process, I think that there's three things um, that we would advise anybody to be thinking about. Um, and, and one is kind of the, the measure twice, cut once approach. You know, make sure you know where you're starting off from and that you have your data before you go, go forward. Don't just sort of knee jerk into a commitment. Um, but have a really clear and ambitious vision, which is possibly broader than you might have thought it was. So, you know, think Cape Canaveral, Kennedy talking to the janitor, what's your role here? I'm helping to put a man on the moon. It's it's like, what's your wider social purpose? And make sure that your, your, um, your ambitions are both long term, but also immediate term. So they're action based, but the, that you've got good ambition. If you can hit your ambition by next year, it's not ambitious enough. And the third time is really spend time on how are you going to do this? So these things do cost time and money. You have to resource it. You have to plan it. You have to have a tactical plan. And you also need to know who do you need to partner with? Who do you need to collaborate with? Where does the innovation need to come into this plan? Um, and, and, and spend time with that because I think there's a lot of, oh, yeah, we'll have a commitment and, um, and then we'll wait five years and then realise we're not going to hit our commitment and then start again with another commitment, you know, and, and, and things are changing. It is changing. It's not like that now today. But I think that those three steps um, are, are a really good way of thinking about this um, to take the right action at the right time. No, thank you. And it's a good follow-up. So, uh, well, uh, well done. And um, Richard, uh, perhaps could I ask you? Yeah. Um, so, look, I don't think it's any one thing. I, I think, um, what is the one thing? You know, uh, I, I don't think it is one thing. If it was one thing, we'd already have it. It would be there. You would be asking this question. Um, Lorraine said something that kind of got me a little bit. She said, people like me would be afraid of change. You must be bloody joking. We spend our days changing from one thing to the next, to the next, to the next. We're from the rural community. The question to Lorraine and everybody else is, who's going to pay for it? That's the question. Now, we are a conduit. It would pass right through us to somebody else. That's how it's going to work. Most, most, mostly to the ones to this audience. That's how it works. So be careful what you do, because you will end up with a cost base that is unsustainable. That's all I said. Listen, we would use hydrogen if we thought it would work. We would use it tomorrow. I was the one was was chasing Nikola trucks. I thought it was the greatest thing ever heard of until we found out it was a fraud. You know, we know people with gas trucks. They have six of them parked up. We know other people that it actually works for them. Does that mean gas is wrong? It is not. Uh, we know people... One of our biggest business partners has an electric truck parked on the roundabout when you go into the building, but it doesn't work for them, for the mass. So the question is, do you want, do you want 100% of one man's effort or do you want 1% of 100 people's effort? I think you want to change the masses. And with that, like in our sector, if we could reduce emissions by 50%, it's massive. And somebody talked about taking less weight on a trailer. They're wrong. You should take 30 tons, 40 tons, 
and reduce the amount of, of uh, times you have to make these movements. But look, it's all mathematics, okay? And I, I can assure you this, <laughs> if it would work, if it's the cheaper, efficient uh, sweet spot, we're business people, we will be doing it. And if we're not doing it now, as the rules change in front of us, we will change those rules. I was having a little bit of a pop off the government guys because look guys, it's all very well to say these things, but don't put it to me because I know what works in the main and I know what does not work. But I, 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 I say, yes, we, we could have a pop, we could have a go at this. So our job is to remove emissions, which nobody wants to grasp by 50%, and I've already told you, we could do half of that now. So, there you go. Uh, thanks, Richard. Uh, and, and Robert, uh, quickly, I, oh, sorry, I don't mean that in a rude way, but we are over time, so fine. if you fine. could. I'll, I'll, I'll be brief. Uh, the transition to a 100% electric car fleet will be an incremental journey over a number of years, and Quivian showed in his slides that the government wants a million electric vehicles on Irish roads by 2030. It's an admirable aspiration, but it's mathematically impossible. And one of our uh, panellists mentioned data, data, data. And I'll give you data. There's 22,000 battery electric vehicles in the park today of 2.2 of, uh, million uh, on the road today. So 1% is electric. Um, what the government really needs to look at, of that 2.2 million, 900,000 vehicles are over 10 years old, the oldest in Europe. So what we need to focus on is a VRT regime that incentivizes people to, to trade in those cars and buy lower emission battery electric vehicles and petrol and diesel as long as they're available for the next nine years. That's the only way we can achieve uh, our viable emission targets. And I don't want the government uh, to lose that opportunity uh, to use the head so, and, you know, look for some joined up thinking. And I think, I think it's achievable, uh, but they have to just stop being silly uh, about ridiculous numbers. Oh, thanks. Uh, and Lorraine, uh, if you could be the last, the last answer and uh, uplift us at the end. <laughs> Pressure. And my apologies to uh, Richard. I, I meant just the industries that are greatest impact by this change is what I had meant. And my apologies for um, For me, I think it is investing at the grassroots in community walkability. Um, because I feel like if you can, if you can, like encourage those local trips, but then also um, supporting local enterprise and um, keeping money within communities when money is spent in communities from shopping in local shops, increasing the health and well-being, it's going to have a, a much greater impact. But also the good walkability supports good pub, uh, public transport systems as well, and making the most sustainable choices the easiest choices. And uh, again, to finish with a great answer and an uplifting answer. So thank you for that. I see, uh, John, uh, so thank you everybody, uh, our speakers, our panelists, and of course the audience. Uh, you know, we love having these debates because we don't maybe find the answers, but maybe we find a route to an answer or maybe discover some, some quick wins that are uh, really, really going to change our lives, but change our lives for the better. So thank you very much to everybody. If I could turn to John McGrain, I believe you're there, John, if you want yeah, to... Uh, uh, thanks so much, Mark. Thanks up. to you for chairing. Thanks indeed, Mark. And thanks for chairing such a brilliant discussion, really stimulating. Um, doesn't solve the problem, but it certainly helps us to work together on the problem. Uh, and for, for I, I, we're privileged to have Mark Varian as chair uh, of our Energy and, and Environment Committee at the British Irish Chamber. And indeed, the uh, very constructive support of Evershed Sutherland uh, in all the work that we do. Uh, thanks also to... Um, our other partners in producing today's event, uh, the British Embassy and the Department for International Trade, uh, but not least uh, our great friends and distinctive partners who are real uh, thought and action leaders uh, across the globe on the whole area of climate um, climate change and achieving you know big ambitious goals and not least in the run-up to COP26. Uh, thanks to our own team, uh, led by Paul Lynham and uh, Catherine, of course, and the rest of our team behind the scenes. Paul might just shout the date of our upcoming two meetings that will be of interest to people. Uh, Paul, the Adam Posen, Dr. Adam Posen event is next week, yeah? 
Yeah, Adam Pogan, one of the world's leading macroeconomists and trade economists, is uh, next Tuesday at 3 p.m. And then this day, two weeks, we have the conclusion of our Road to COP26 series with Instinctive Partners in the British Embassy. And that will focus on uh, the agri-food sector, so one of the most the, the most yep. important sector in relation to Ireland. So um, hopefully we'll have a, another robust debate then this day, two weeks. So, so keep an eye out for the invitations to, to both of those, if you would, please, and, and, and feel free to join us. Um, thanks so much to our panellists and, uh, first of all, to our two keynotes, Speakers, Dr. Bob Morn and Kevin O'Kirwan. Um, and I was really reassured to hear Kieran in his first day in his new office uh, talk to the, uh, as he said, the reassuring alignment of policy and uh, and intent uh, as between the UK and Ireland. And as the British Irish Chamber of Commerce, we constantly speak to that piece about alignment. The 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 um, the climate doesn't know where the border is. And uh, this is an absolutely shared challenge of huge proportion, as our panellists have spoken to today, to Butta, to Kate, uh, to Lorraine, to Robert and to Richard. Thanks so much for your contributions. Uh, it is a massive challenge. It is a daunting challenge, but it is filled with massive ambition. And, and things like technology, you know, from batteries to hydrogen and many other uh, advancing technologies are helping, helping us with that. And equally, you know, both Richard and Robert called out the need for realism. In the real world, it's one thing to set a target, but they have to be executable. Uh, but they both spoke to the art of the possible, and our, as our other panelists did. So we really appreciate that. And one, one thing that certainly occurs to us is about the importance of the social sciences as well as the hard engineering sciences in this space. And uh, I think it was Lorraine spoke to the point about community, not least. And, and this will be ultimately about community behavior and community involvement and community engagement in these programs. So the social sciences are just as important as the, as the hard sciences. At the end of the day, for us, this is about joined up thinking. We constantly speak to that point. It's all very well having, you know, big ambition and individual targets, but they have to get joined up both at the thinking level, at the planning level and at the implementation level. And for us in the British Irish Chamber of Commerce, this project is yet another in how we help the joining up process by hosting such cross stakeholder conversations as we've been doing today. So thanks most of all to all of you for joining us in that joined up conversation. We hope you found it useful. We hope you take some valuable takeaways and we look forward to maintaining the dialogue and to supporting you in your um, individual sectors and your endeavours to on this daunting but highly ambitious and exciting journey ahead. Gormila Magad Galair, we look forward to seeing you at our upcoming events and in the meantime, stay safe from all of us. God bless.